Yes, because as that part of the slide says, my name is Steve, and as this part of the slide says, I'm a little bit of a geek. Now, if we've all turned up to the correct conference, this is a talk about Ada Lovelace and the very first computer program. Over the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to be talking about what that program was, what it did, how it worked. I'm going to transform that program piece by piece into JavaScript so we can run it in the modern world. Why JavaScript? Well, it is just the best language, right? <laughs> Correct answer. <laughs> After all of that, we've done the techie things. We'll look at the whole social history part about Ada herself. Was she really the first computer program? And we have Ada with us tonight. She's here. This is Ada. Who was here for last year's FFConf? And who remembers the talk about programming with yarn? This was created by Lily, who created that talk about programming with yarn. And it was meant to be on the stage with her during that talk. But Ada stayed at home, forgotten. So Ada has to come today to do the talk with me. So hello, Ada. Thank you for coming. So with all of that kerfuffle out of the way, who am I? What have I done to deserve a place on this stage? Or is this slide, it should be called the ego slide. <laughs> this is where the speaker brags about themselves for 10 minutes while everyone checks their email. So I am a, a developer. I've always been a developer. I've been a junior developer when I was yay high. I'm a, you know, I've done the uh, junior, senior, CTO things. I've worked in games, IoT, education technology. I have built systems uh, which display uh, digital signage, which you'll see in airports and bus stations around the world. I've done you know, various entrepreneurial things. And yes, I am reading my own CV, because I can't remember half the stuff I've done. Uh, I've messed around with AR, VR, Alexa, Leap Motion. I created a synthesizer you play by waving your hands over the air, just like an old theremin. And I'm a big open source advocate. Spoken at FOSDEM and various other conferences. I like my Linux. I like my open source. And all of that is so not important. I mean, I help out at the Computer Museum in Cambridge. I give tours to school kids there, I explain a bit about the history of computers. But I'm, I'm doing that as a volunteer. It's a bit of fun. I'm not doing that because I'm a professor of computer science. I'm not doing that because I have a doctorate in history. All of this, everything you're going to see today, is stuff that I have learned or researched on my own just by having an interest in this. Now, all of that is a very long-winded way of saying, if I can do this, anyone can. So with that in mind, let's have a look at it. That's Ada as well. That's made out of Lego. I'm also a fan of Lego as well, so I decided I'd make a little portrait for the, for the talk. Uh, no bananas for scale, I'm afraid. Just have to accept that I am six foot, and that is quite big. So what was that first actual program? What was, you know, what's it look like? Where was it? Well, it's that. That was the very first computer program. Everyone got that? Good. OK, time for the pub. We've, we're done. <laughs> oh, you want me to go do more, right? OK, fine. Uh, Remy says keep going. So this was that program. Uh, it was an appendix of a translation of a book by Luigi Menabre. He wrote about Charles Babbage's analytical engine. And he said, oh, yeah, it does this and it does it that. But he didn't do it in English. So it needed translating. And the person who translated it was Ada Lovelace. She was very well known in those sort of circles. Her mother was, uh, I think they called her the princess of calculus or something. Very clever mathematician. Naturally, Ada was in that sort of hierarchy of society. Her teachers were people like George Boole, who came up with Boolean logic, De Morgan, who has De Morgan's theorem, also about logic. So she was brought up pretty well and understood this stuff. So it's not surprising that she was friends with Babbage. And when Babbage said, oh, Luigi's written this book about my thing. Would you mind translating it? She goes, oh, yeah, I can do that. She knew the mathematics, she knew the machine. Well, enough about it anyway. But the problem was the book itself wasn't very good. And in the process of translating it, she had to add extra notes to clarify things, fix things. And in the process of just translating the book, she made it three times bigger. <laughs> and in part of that three times bigger book, was a series of appendices. In one of those appendices was a note. And in that note was this, that first program. 
So let's break it down. What it does is it calculates Bernoulli numbers. If we have mathematicians or engineers in the audience, you'll be going, oh, yeah, I know Bernoulli numbers. I use them. I see what they do. For the rest of us mere mortals, this is a series of Bernoulli numbers. They're just numbers. They're useful in things, but on their own, they're not that interesting. The bits to notice is we have 0, 1, and 2, and then no other odd number. That's not because we sort of forgot how to count back in the 1840s. It's just that all of these numbers which are missing are zero. So they're not very interesting, so there's no point in putting them in the table. So these are the numbers. Back in the day, these numbers would be computed by hand by a person who would be called, quite literally, a computer. A mathematician that just took the equations and then executed upon them. If anyone's seen the film Hidden Figures, you'll know that the women in that film were known as computers. They're the ones that created the maths to actually fly rockets up to the moon. And if you haven't seen that film, go and see that film. It is brilliant. And Bernoulli numbers will feature in there somewhere. But you've got to compute these, and obviously that could lead to errors. Someone copies out a number wrong when they're trying to do their maths. Someone does the maths incorrectly as they compute it. Or when it's finished and someone at the printers puts that number into the book, there's, a, there's room for error there as well. So obviously having machines do this would be considered a good idea. Now, Babbage had already created the difference engine that could perform mathematics, but it didn't do fractions. It did it in decimals. And the decimals don't give you any clue either. These numbers are computed, but they're not obvious. You can't just say, oh, can you tell me the 12th Bernoulli number? It's not possible unless you also know the 11th, the 10th, the 9th, and the 8th, and so on. So we've got to literally compute this using a whole series of fractions. Now, there are a lot of algorithms that you can use to calculate Bernoulli numbers, and we will use this one as an example. Everyone got that? Any questions? No? Good. Go down the pub now, right? No. OK. So this is fairly obvious, I think. It's just doing a whole load of 2n minus 1s and 2n plus 1s. There's not a lot going on there. If we reorder this a little bit, this is what it looks like. And this now comes and kind of says, OK, you can see what's going on a bit now. You're do, you've got this a0, which is just an equation. And you add it to another version of equation multiplied by a thing. And then you add another thing, multiply by another thing, and so on. And if you look at the pattern here, you can see it progresses. Each one is just slightly more complex with a slightly different set of terms afterwards. So this is the sort of thing that a machine should really be doing, this repetitive job that has a very obvious progression. So we can use this, reorder it, and calculate these Bernoulli numbers from what is essentially a series of very small, dull functions. And you can probably look at this right now and go, yep, I can see exactly what to do. I could write this in JavaScript right now. And you could. But she didn't have JavaScript. I mean, come on. They hadn't even built the analytical engine. It was too expensive for them to build. So this computer that the program was written for didn't even exist. So she'd have to invent the computer, then a programming language, then the web. And yeah, it's, so she just wrote it down on paper. So how does it go about doing that? What is their approach? So remember this one? Let's go down and let's have a look at what's happening. Because it is very, very traditional in this whole ma mathematics sense of you have nice columns where everything in the column is doing the same bit. So everything in that first column is the number of the operation. It's a line number. So for people that remember basic and remember typing 10 print, Thomas is an idiot, 20 go to 10, it's a line number. That's what it is. Um, she was not using 10 or 20 because you know, that was a later invention. But 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, you get the idea. Nothing too clever there. The next one is the nature of the operation. Here we have a multiply, a subtract, and a plus. There's also a divide. There is also a, nope, that's it. Four instructions. That's all it does. The basic four arithmetics. Next, we have the variables acted upon. And I do appreciate that with a 200-year-old you know, manuscript, it's not that easy to read. But we do have a v2 multiplied by a v3. OK, fine, fair enough. The variable's receiving the result. That's in this column. So we perform the multiplication, v2 times v3, and then we put that result 
into v4 and v5 and v6. We're writing one result into multiple places. Fair enough. No. We then indicate the change in value on any variable, and that's this column. What does all that mean? Well, if you look at this little splodge here, that's a number as well. And it's slightly more visible here. You can see here, just about, it says 1v4 and 1v3. This one of the v3 says how many times that variable has changed in its lifetime. So here, when we start off, it's changed once. It's the first time it's used. Nothing much has happened. But when it's used again here, it's now 2v3, because it's used here and here. This is almost like a self-check. As you work through the program, you can say, I've seen v2 three times now, but this is telling me it's only been changed twice. So either this number is wrong, or I've counted the variables wrong. So it's a nice little indication on, am I doing the job properly? Next up, we have this statement of results. This is what, what it's actually doing. We're saying we're multiplying two variables together, but they're called v2 and v3. They don't have any meaning. There were no variable names. So it's just, what is it doing? It's saying 2n, essentially. So something there is a 2, something there indicates an n, and it's doing 2n. And then the next line, there's a subtraction, and this thing will have a 1 in it, which implies this is a 2n minus 1. And so it goes on. I said there were four instructions, add, subtract, divide, and multiply. Where's equals? Where's the sign? Where's all that gone? Well, it wasn't there at all. Now, based on the idea of the program, how do you get information in? How do you assign variables, values to variables? Well, you don't, but you set it up at the start. So these columns are your variables. This indicates what is in each variable at each part of the program. If there's this little dot, that just says, well, it's the same as what it was last week. And here, this variable at the beginning is set up to be one. And it is always one. Because every single instruction down here operates on a variable, there is no way of saying, take v and add 1 to it. It's not possible, because everything has to be a variable, operation, variable. So she puts 1 into v1, because that's a nice naming convention. It reminds you what's in v, and just then doesn't change it. v2 has the number 2 in it, and just doesn't change. And the third variable is n. So if you're computing the fourth Bernoulli number, n is 4. You set it up by setting your cogs in the computer to be n is 4. And so it goes. And that's how you initialize the machine. And then once you finish running the program, you look at what the particular variables on this side give you as a result. Uh, yep, 1, 2, and 4. A slightly clearer version, I hope, there. So let's go back to that first section of code, the first six lines, and let's just walk through it like a dry run, as, as it were. So we start off with v2 times v3. Well, we know v2 is always a 2, because it's a nice constant. That's, that's how we have to do it. v2 times v3, which is 2n, write the results into 4, 5, and 6. Even now, we don't have many programming languages that will write the result into multiple places at the same time. Bear in mind, this was intended to be a program for a mechanical machine. And every time a mechanical machine has to turn the cogs, that's effort. So they decided, well, if it's going to be a lot of effort to turn these cogs, let's just move it once when we create the result. That'll be fine. Next, we have 2n minus 1. So we've already got our 2n into v4, which we computed here, and we subtract 1 from v1, which is the constant that we have. Brilliant. Then we do some addition. So we're creating another variable with a 2n plus 1, because at some point there's going to be this 2n minus 1 all over 2n plus 1. And we do that by dividing this value with this. Hang on, wait a minute. Let's have a look. v4 is 2n minus 1. v5 is 2n plus 1. But here we're saying v5 divided by v4. v5 is that, 2n plus 1, divided by 2n minus 1. This is not 2n plus 1 divided by 2n minus 1. That's the other way around. Oops. Not only has she created the first computer program, she's created the first computer bug. Well done, Ada. Yeah, now, you look at that, and, and it is a bug. It is actually in there, in black and white printed. She made a mistake. Now, the mistake she made was actually in the comments, which is essentially this bit. We talk about this as being the result of what's happening. This is really a comment to remind you of what's going on here. 
But unfortunately, because they don't match, if it's wrong. Both are wrong. If comments and code don't match, everything is wrong. That's the very first example on line four of the first program. Sorry, Ada, you got it wrong. <laughs> so let's start moving this now into a simulator. And as I say, I'm, I'm using JavaScript for this. Uh, you could probably reinterpret this in your head into any language of choice. So I've got my comment for my line number, because we all put comments in our code, right? We all put comments in our code, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nervous laugh, yeah, no one does, do they? So we've got our comment for our line number, and we've got a comment of what it actually does, taken directly from the program itself. We then have our operation, multiply, uh, divide, subtract, uh, and I'm using the X rather than the star, which is more traditional. Um, oh, by the way, boring mid later activity thing. You know the star, which we use for multiply and for globbing? When you do like a DIR star or an LS star, and it takes everything in, that's everything. That's like the life, the universe, and everything, right? The number 42 from Hitchhikers. What is the ASCII value for the star? It's 42. I'm not sure if that's a coincidence. Whoever came up with that did it intentionally. I'd like to think it is just part of the universe's great big joke. So I used the X just because I, I thought so. We have the two operations, so the variable 2 and variable 3. Just stuck them in A and V. Uh, I could have called them V1, V2, because that, but that might confuse things. It could have been Freddie and Mercury, for all I care. They were just placeholder objects. And then D for destination. I thought about that one for a little while. And this time, it's an array. It has to be an array because we can write the result into more than one place in the same operation. No other line in that program, however, writes a variable into more than one place. She created this entire idea for one line of code. I mean, it's possible to go do without it. You, know, you could have a variable with zero in it. And you could say, well, I'll add this variable to zero and write the result over here. That's essentially the same as assignment. And you just don't need the assign operation. You can just still use it with standard operations. Uh, if, you were, if you were into the computer science and the minimalist idea, you don't actually need an add instruction in your programming set. You can do everything with subtraction. You want to do add? Subtract a negative number. That's the same thing. And there is uh, the, one of the, the very, well, what is considered to be the first digitally stored programmable computer manufactured for, uh, in, in Manchester in 1947, 1948, was the SSEM, aka the Manchester Baby. The Manchester Baby does not have an add instruction. The only things it can do is subtract or basically go negative, which is basically subtracting from zero. Only thing it could do. You could jump to another line if you wanted, great, but you couldn't jump to a line. You could only jump to uh, the location of a variable. So exactly the same as what Ada has here. She has a variable, V2, which always stores the number 2. In the Manchester Baby, if you wanted to jump to line 2, you had to have a memory location which stored the value of 2. And that was pretty much taken from this idea, or maybe inspired from this idea. So, Going back to the JavaScript, our line number, our operation, the two operands, the variables, and the destination. And I faithfully copied this out from the original paper into my JavaScript editor. We then have to write a simulator. And it does exactly what you think it needs to do. It needs to bring in the variables, needs to work out what they are. I'm using a nice named state, because it's a nice generic term. I'm picking up the variable and I'm multiplying it by the other variable for the case of x. Now, the operation here is going into the mill. Now, the mill is what they used to call the accumulator. Uh, because mill is sort of a bit archaic, we now still think of accumulators. But back in the 40s, the machines in the 50s, and even in the 60s, people were still using the word mill to mean accumulator, or that temporary store where calculations happen. Why mill? I think it's because the original machines with the Jacquard loom were basically set around mill towns. But I'm not old enough to do that part of history. Who said yes? <laughs> you can go off people, you know. So we have a basic simulator here. We read the operation. 
We see what it does, and then we go away and do it. I don't even check for divide by zero. Spoiler alert, I know what the program does, and I knew it wouldn't divide by zero. So I was safe not checking it. Uh, and I also use the word simulator. There is a nice big argument stroke debate in the community uh, uh, for retro and for emulations on, is it really an emulator, or is it a simulator? Because there is this sort of difference of, well, is it simulating what the machine would have done, meaning it's going to do the thing in exactly the same way as what the machine did, or is it emulating it to mean it's just doing something that looks a bit similar? Or is it vice versa? No, that depends on which person you're speaking to at the time, because they can't agree on the terminology half the time. I think the general rule seems to be nowadays, emulator is for when it does it in a similar fashion, but not identical, uh, but, and simulator is for you do it exactly the way the machine used to. But that's an argument for someone else. It's like arguing about tabs and spaces. The answer is tabs, by the way. That got a bigger positive response than I thought it was going to. I was expecting at least half of the audience to walk out at that point. So we've got our basic simulator. It's just a big loop. It does this switch thing every instruction, and off it goes. It produces a whole set of results. Once we've got that result, we feed it into each of the variables that's been requested. As I say, this construct is only needed for one instruction once. And then we increment the program counter, and we go all the way around again. I'm writing it this way because that is probably how it would have worked in the uh, machinery of the day. Obviously, we'd do plus plus PC nowadays. So who remembers this thing? Way back at the beginning. We can see what we're doing here, roughly. We're doing an operation with a number three in it. And then we get, when we get to the next binary number, we do it again with a number four, and so on and so on. And there's more terms that get added on each time round. So, that requires a loop of some description. And here we have that first loop. It sits between line 23 and 24, and it says, here follows a repetition of operations 13 to 23. They didn't have copy and paste. It's just saying, I can't be bothered to repeat this. I can't be bothered to come up with the, the concept of a for loop or a while loop or a do repeat until loop. I'm just going to say, go and do it again. And she did. She, that's, she, she's created the very first loop. Well done. Um, yeah, problem with that. Every single time I've talked about a variable, it's v2, it's v3. It is never vn. It's not take the value out of this variable and then go to that variable's number. There is absolutely no way in her designation of programming languages, and there was only one at the time, to be fair, where it would say go to an arbitrary variable. Essentially, you need a, an array, an array index. So there, because there is no way of saying go to a particular variable, this loop would never have worked. It is just not possible to do it. So when I did the simulator, I had to invent a little way around it. And this is the, sort of the next stage. Once I'd done the simulator, I said, OK, now let's improve upon that idea. So this, as an example, we've got our variable two times variable three thing again, and we put them into the various states. That's exactly what you'd expect it to do if you were taking it very literally. Well, magic numbers, never a good idea, so let's give it a name, n2, m1, which is n times two minus one. I could have done underscore 2n just to make it match, because we can't start variable names with the number two. Maybe someone has come up with a programming language where you can, just to be fun. I think Julia allows you to use emojis as variable names. So it is probably possible at some point that language will be invented. Until it is, you've got this notation. So it, at least you understand at least what's in that variable now. That makes a little bit more sense. And instead of going this whole, oh, minus one, because we know variable one always contains one, let's just write that explicitly, subtract one. And we, as we accumulate, I'll give it an actual name called accumulating total. Because the same as we all put comments in our code, we all have variable names that are meaningful and descriptive and non-ambiguous, right? Yeah. <laughs> One of us has. <laughs> so by repeating this process for every line of the code, giving it sensible variable names, looking at what the result is actually meant to do, and not doing the whole total equals zero, and then adding a comment saying, this sets the total to zero, 
we're actually me putting something meaningful in here. Numerators and denom denominators. Remember, we're saying that this calculation is done on fractions, and the algorithm was working with the fractions, so let's give them the proper names. We've got our loop here, which was the bit that was missing in the original. K, which is that sort of index. We've got our own index to result here. And every time we do this computation, we move around to a new variable. Now, as we've said, this would not have existed in the original machine. And it's very difficult to know how it would have been implemented. It was a series of gears, essentially, a whole load of cogs. So how are you going to move to say, that? well, don't go into that cog. Go into that cog. You can't move the cog. So it'd been interesting to know what sort of technology would have been used to implement that had it existed in real life. And once we're finished moving our results onto the next one, next one, next one, we, we do the uh, accumulating. Uh, so, so here, for example, you see each one, each term you add a little bit more on. Add it in and boom, there's our total. And it's got the minus sign because you may also remember everything was minus b of n, minus b, minus b. So just negate it, that's it. That's, that's what the algorithm required. So it's done. We've now seen the original program. We've pulled it to bits. We've simulated it. And we've now rewritten it in something that is reasonably legible. Now we come to the fun bit. Was she really the first programmer? Now, oh boy. If you go online, you will find some people who actually aren't very nice. Uh, maybe it's just me. Maybe I've just got that sort of personality that brings out the trolls and the idiots and that. But uh, yeah, some people out there like to go on, well, she wasn't really a programmer, was she? It's like, well, why would you say that? And there's always a reason. One of them is that the code has a bug. Line four. Uh, anyone here not written a bug? <laughs> I'm not convinced that writing a bug is a thing to exclude you from being a programmer. If it's anything, it's like a rite of passage. You have to write bugs. So that's pretty much a, that's, that's a rubbish argument. Don't, don't agree with that. Uh, next one, the notation is problematic. Yeah, taking a few bits of sort of license there, writing things in more than one place. Uh, and you know, a odd few bits of cheating thereabouts, but this is the first program. There's nothing to go on. So what's wrong with the notation? It serves its purpose. It communicates an idea. When I first did this, this was I did this about three, four years ago. And when I was working through that program, her document from 1940 something conveyed an idea to me nearly 200 years later. If it does the job of conveying an idea across centuries from someone who's now long dead, then it's done a pretty good job at communicating. So what's the problem? Just because someone doesn't like it because it's a bit different, it's fine. Notation problematic? No, it's fine. Next problem, the loop didn't work. Now, we know the loop didn't work. I can't help that, you know, but we knew the intent. The idea of there is an algorithm. You can go through a series of steps to get a result, and they can be programmatic steps. And that's important. There's no human involved in this. The human doesn't need to suddenly go, oh, right, let's just flip this little bit or let's set this switch to something else. It could be completely autonomous. And that was the important step of this program and the idea of computation. She was translating somebody else's work. So she wasn't a translator. She, as we said, she added to the book. The original book grew three times in the course of her working on it. There's a lot of things in that book that would not have existed if it weren't for her. So labeling it as just a translator would say, well, you're not a computer, if you, you're not a computer programmer if you use a compiler. Because the compiler is actually writing the code, not you. So that as an argument doesn't wash for me. And Babbage must have already written some programs for his own machine. Well, not really. He was an engineer, quite a good engineer, because he managed to design nice things and set them all up, and there were some um, Parts of working in the Science Museum in London. Um, fortunately, he was not that pleasant a person. And when you're trying to build a big mechanical machine with very precise gears, you need good craftsmen to make good quality gears. That means you need to pay them. Babbage didn't have the money, and he didn't have the niceties to get money. His approach would say, Oi, you, give me money. 
which apparently is not the way you go to VCs. But that is the way he did, which is why the analytical engine never got built. He was losing money, and he wasn't very nice about it, and no one was going to give him any more. So he wasn't really interested in the software thing. He was interested in mechanics. How do we make this machine? So, yeah, if Babbage had done something, it wasn't that big or, or important. So with all of these, was Ada the first program or not, there is one... I, I, I turn the problem around. If everyone says she's not a programmer because of this, she's not a programmer because of that, she's not a programmer because of the other, what about if I say, well, she was a programmer because of this reason? Then surely I can win the argument. Because winning arguments on the internet is exactly what it's all about. <laughs> so I started thinking along these lines. I'm thinking, well, what else has she done? It's like, it's not just this program. As a consequence, she went on and said, well, look, I'm computing numbers for the sake of computing more numbers. That's fine. It's a machine. That's what it's there for. But what if instead of numbers, each number represented a word? This means a computer could generate poetry. She invented ChatGPT just 200 years early. She also thought, what if each number was a musical note? That's MIDI. Or it could be a dot, a color, which you could then arrange in a nice sequence. Thanks for inviting, inviting, inventing Photoshop, all before its time. She had these ideas. She'd written about them. She's seen that a program could be more than just crunching numbers. She understood all of this. And still, it's like, nah, she's just a translator. It's just this, just that. So I needed an argument that would, once and for all, just say, why should she be the first programmer? And I have all of these arguments of why she should and why, you know, all the things that she's done and has left us with. And the only thing I could come up with was this. Look at everything that she did. The program, the idea of algorithms, the use of variables, all of the things that we take for granted, inventing bugs, breaking loops. She had invented a notation and a way of storing a program for people and machines. She came out the idea of using machines for art, for, for writing, for, for images, for sound. She'd written this stuff. She'd documented this. She had created an entire science. If a man had done all of that, would he have been considered the first programmer? And I think he would have done. So if he would have been considered the first programmer, then she should be considered the first programmer, and therefore, Ada is the first programmer. <laughs> yes, this is the tweak shot, this one here. <laughs> and for those in the video, if we can just cut that bit where my screensaver kicked in, <laughs> that'll be fine. Yeah, she didn't invent the screensaver. <laughs> but because all of this stuff that she did, she is the first programmer. Well done. And this is the first computer program. Now you know how it works, what it does, you can go and write your own. So we pretty much wrap it up there. Let's go back on a minor recap. The first programmer did the decimal approximations of Bernoulli numbers. We say it's decimal approximations because all of the gears would move a fixed amount. They had numbers on them. That was the idea. That was the design. And there is plans to try and uh, accumulate all of Babbage's writings in a project that would say, how would this have worked had it been built? And there are people who are trying to do this right now. It's a big project going on. Uh, but these, were, you know, these gears would have had numbers on, so it was not an, uh, an analog. It was a digital, it's a zero or it's a one. So it was a decimal approximation of the Bernoulli number calculation, which, as we've seen, is inherently fractions. So there's going to be some really long recurring digits and things like that. The algorithm has been described. We know what to do with it. We know how it works, and we've seen it in JavaScript. As I say, it's a fun exercise. Now you know there's a bug in line four, and now you know there's a loop that can never work. You're perfectly, you can go away and not have to suffer the indignity I had of sitting there for hours saying, why doesn't this work? Oh, bug. So you can do it now safely and not have to waste that time. And, and it is nowadays, now I know what I'm looking for, you can code that stuff up in half an hour. Originally, it took hours because of the bug. 
And we've also found that Ada was the first programmer because of not only what she did, but how she did it. And with that, we say, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be here for the rest and for anything that does beer, so you can ask me any other questions about the advocacy back then. So I will leave it there and say thank you all for your attention and good night.